Welcome to History Talk, the history podcast for everyone, produced by Origins. I'm your host, Patrick Patyandi. What happens when antitrust class action lawsuits meet college sports? It's a question inspired by the recent O'Bannon v. NCAA court case. This month, we've decided to get to the bottom of the current issues facing universities and college sports. In this episode of History Talk's two-part feature on the history of the NCAA, History Talk host Leticia Wiggins interviews Pulitzer Prize-winning civil rights writer and Atlantic Magazine contributor Taylor Branch. They discuss not only the current conundrum of college sports, but also the historical trends that explain it. So to begin this conversation, we'd really like to ask you what you would consider the primary problem of college sports. The primary problem of college sports is that some universities, not all, a small number of universities, have started a multi-billion dollar side business uh, using the talent of their undergraduate students. And that is a big conflict because the two worlds are separate. Now, the way they've handled it so far is through the NCAA is to pretend that big-time college sports are part of the educational purpose, that, that athletes who are playing on ESPN and, and Fox television earning, generating millions of dollars are, are really kind of in a different kind of classroom and that the university is supervising them and that this is part of their educational experience and that professionalized, commercialized sports and academics are, are the same thing. That's captured in the classic phrase, student athlete, that mm-hmm. everybody who plays in these games, e- even if they're generating millions of dollars and people are breathless about them on television, adult announcers, uh, that they're still student athletes and that they're students first. And that if you look at them um, in the sports business, uh, you are you are depriving them of their student purpose, and um, so basically what I'm saying is you can't manage conflict between academics and commercialized sports unless you recognize that they are different. They are different in kind, and that's the problem of college sports today. And I think basically uh, it's getting sports in trouble because they're commercialized, and, and it's getting colleges in trouble too because. They're failing, they're, they're getting corrupted by sports. It's a problem on both sides of the equation. What would the solution be? Well, I think basically all of us have to take our blinkers off and, 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 and be reminded that there are millions of students in the United States who are working while they're in school. According to the census, about 14 million of the 20 million uh, college students uh, are working either full-time or part-time jobs. Nobody worries about interfering with their arrangements, whatever they can generate, whether they're a, a billionaire starting Facebook while they're at Harvard or delivering pizzas or an entrepreneur or a musician or anything else. It's their business. Only it, with these a few hundred thousand athletes do we say it's our business to regulate what they can and can't earn while they're working at school. Is it just a different focus on value of work? And I think it's, tra- it's tradition, and we've gotten into the habit of, of, uh, of getting a, a, a great deal um, in our college sports, and people are attached to it. And the people who supervise college sports, that is the administrators and the, and the, and the coaches, uh, want to have the athletes getting as little money as possible, even though they also want their sport to generate as much money as possible. So it's highly aggressively commercialized, and yet they're attached for, I think, a combination of selfish reasons and brainwashed reasons to the notion that it is a noble thing to deprive the athletes of any voice in, um, in their own enterprise. I mean, mm-hmm. the world is kind of turned upside down. The NCAA literally defines it as unethical if athletes uh, ask for any money, if they bargain for it, if they bargain for better health care, if they bargain for uh, safer helmets, if they bargain for a bigger stipend so that, so that they can um, pursue their education uh, uh, afterwards uh, or for anything else, it's considered unethical. They say it would exploit college athletes to, um, if they were, became part of a commercialized enterprise. And that turns the whole meaning of the word upside down, because in ordinary speech, you exploit somebody if you don't pay them. 
and they've got us all believing that it would exploit players if they did have rights to bargain like Mm -hmm. anybody else. Like you and I assume that we have the right to bargain for our talent in any job, but for players alone, we um, we bar that, and we and we and we all think that something very pure is at stake, and it's it's just because we we can't see through the reality. The solution is very simple in a way. If you simply acknowledge that all the NCAA's restrictions on what college athletes can and can't do are bogus, if they amount to a collusion to prohibit those athletes from having bargaining rights to protect themselves first, um, things would change. I mean, college athletes would be able to bargain like anybody else, whether you're a bookstore cashier or anybody else for the value of your work, and colleges then would be forced to choose between... Uh, how they're how they're going to manage a, a commercial enterprise that uses their students on the one hand and an academic enterprise in which the athletes that are generating all this money are also students and they 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 would have to make those decisions but they don't want to they they want to have their cake and eat it too and say that they're educating the students really what what happens is the students don't get a good education or their rights or mm-hmm. any money uh, so they're exploited in both sense uh, often um, because what becomes important to the athletic departments in these big-time schools is the eligibility of the athletes, and, and they will compromise the education um, with pressure and all kinds of other things, as we've seen in so many scandals. This problem of college sports, it seems so particular to the U.S., and university sports exist elsewhere. I mean, there are clearly other models to follow, such as club sports abroad. Why is the U.S. such an outlier? And can we learn from these other nations, in your opinion? Well, most other nations um, uh, still view the universities as a, as a place for the development of the mind, that that is a specialized uh, function. Sports in the United States, college sports, developed uniquely right after the Civil War, Uh, at a time when the rest of the world, particularly Europe, uh, was all involved in colonizing the world, and we weren't. And and what we had between the Civil War and World War I, um, college sports were were kind of our version of developing uh, manly obsessions on college campuses at a time when Europe was um, um, colonizing the world. And we developed football, we developed rugby, we, de- we developed baseball, we developed um, basketball and all those times, and they were big obsessions. And co- athletes themselves controlled these sports. They scheduled their own games. They did everything for the first 50 or so years. And then um, beginning in the NCAA era a century ago, the universities took control of these sports and, and, and said that the athletes involved um, were still students, and they were under student control, and they built up the myth of this kind of Halls of Ivy, pure athlete who um, uh, didn't care about money, but the university did. So it's an odd, unique history that evolved basically from the Civil War and still has an awful lot of people thinking that there is something pure about college sports because the athletes are also youthful students not encumbered by money, that they're doing it for the pure love of the sport. Right, and that's such an interesting ideal. I mean, you see these in ads for colleges, you know, this image of this very strong, almost like rugby player or football player. And it is kind of this interesting idealized, I mean, maybe an American ideal in a sense, right, of youth yeah. and, and intelligence. Well, it is, and it's, of course it's... but. It, it's interesting when you think about it, even even on a psychological level, because the word amateur, which is it will ultimately be the last defense of the NCAA in saying that we have to keep control of the money and that we can't give athletes the right to bargain for themselves. That's the way it is now. It is a profoundly ambivalent word. I mean, amateur means pure mm-hmm. in the sense that you love doing it. Bobby Jones is the great amateur golfer because... He would always turn down prizes. He only did it for the love. He was the greatest golfer in the world, and he never took a nickel for it out of pure love. But amateur also means that you're no good. Those guys right. are a bunch of amateurs. <laughs> and, and college sports exploits that ambiguity. Uh, nobody wants to see an amateurish Rose Bowl or college football game on national television. They want to see high performance. On the other hand, people are, are, are wedded to the notion somehow 
that these people are are not professionalized, even though it's generating a lot of money. And we get we we get kind of caught in that. The the true meaning of the word amateur, uh, you know, it comes from love, love, you know, uh, ama, uh, amateur, mm-hmm. a lover of. You do it out of mm-hmm. love. It states necessarily that it is that is a subjective choice of the person who's doing it. So that's why Bobby Jones was so noble. He chose. We still have people who can choose to be amateur golfers and then decide to go pro and that sort of thing. But, see, for college athletes, it's not a choice. It's imposed on them. Mm. Uh, they have no choice. So we're, in, we're all caught up in the contradiction within the word amateur because we have a system now that tells these athletes they have to be amateurs by our standards and we're going to keep the money and we're going to do it for your own good so that you can have the blessings of amateurism. And, you know, that's corrupt. It's profoundly exploitive. And the problem is that people don't want to deal with the underlying issues of rights, because if they did, it would be simple. It wouldn't be a factor in 90% of schools. There, are, I think the NCAA has 1,100 members, 900 of those schools, they don't have commercialized sports. They do it for fun. They, if they generate any revenue, it's barely to break even. And if those athletes were told that they could bargain for a salary, they wouldn't get one because there's not any money. Mm-hmm. And those sports are more of our idealized uh, notion of, uh, of sports uh, for, their, for their own right. But at Ohio State and uh, about 100 other schools, uh, where they're generating millions and millions of dollars, right. it would be prof- it would change things profoundly if the athletes uh, could bargain. Um, they they would they would bargain for more money. They would bargain for better health. Uh, they would get it. They would divert money away from coaches. The, the whole market is distorted and rigged by the fact that you are depriving um, the 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 key talent. I mean the talent. I mean, how do you determine who the key talent is? Where the cameras are pointed in a televised game. You don't point the cameras at the coaches you, who are getting all the money. You point the cameras at the players uh, who are generating the interest. And if they had rights, it would change things profoundly. I didn't really notice that about the word amateur, you know, just to begin with. Yeah, yeah well, State is ultimately definitely... the word amateur is where all this thing is right. going to come down at Which... the end. The NCAA right. is going to insist that without its rules, we're losing amateurism because if athletes have rights to bargain, then they will bargain. Uh, None of the college athletes, in in fact, one of the biggest surprises to me in my work was that the representatives of professional athletes are are so against the NCAA amateur rules. not because of what it did to them, but what it, uh, the typical professional athlete that I talked to said, I know dozens and dozens of my college classmates who thought that they were going to make it in the pros, who didn't, who lost their only chance to generate a nest egg out of something that they'd been really good at and it worked out all mm-hmm. their life uh, because of these rules, and now they're ruined and they didn't get a very good education. And so I, as a professional athlete, uh, really want to do what I can to try to get people to wake up and and deal, face the fact that we're exploiting these people by by pretending that there's something noble in uh, confining their rights. Looking at this discussion currently of reform, kind of harkening back to that we were discussing earlier. Yep. So this is nothing new. It's been roached since the turn of the 20th century. But is there anything that's changed in this discussion, or is it just more of the same? Well. It's changed slowly in one way, which is that 30 years ago, when the NCAA controlled all of the televised broadcasts for college football, until the 80s, the NCAA only allowed about 20 games to be broadcast every year. And when that happened, it began to be an antitrust issue, not on behalf of the students, (laughs) but on behalf of the football schools, went to the Supreme Court suing the NCAA, saying, we think this is an illegal market uh, because it's it's rigging, uh, it's keeping us from handling our own broadcasts and everything. Everything has to be routed through the NCAA, and they won. Um, and the NCAA doesn't get any money out of it; only gets basketball money now, not mm. football. And 
when the NCAA tried to regulate the money that coaches get, assistant coaches, it, it put in regulations saying they could only get so much money because the colleges were bidding up their salaries too much. The assistant coaches went to court and also sued, saying you can't rig the market like that. And they won. And the NCAA had to pay them. And now, of course, we have assistant coaches making more than a million dollars a year, let alone head coaches. Uh, so it has become an antitrust issue in the last, 30 years, but so far only for the adults, and only now are the players saying, look, we're the essential people, we're the ones mm -hmm. uh, who, are, who are being affected most by this rigged market. So now you have a big, uh, the O'Bannon lawsuit went to the Supreme Court, and they won on their image rights, saying that the restrictions, NCAA was uh, unfairly in an antitrust law depriving them of the right to bargain over their images and likenesses, that the jerseys mm -hmm. and films of them were sold long after they even left college, and they won. And now um, there's another lawsuit challenging the basic uh, amateur rules as unconstitutional uh, under, the, under the antitrust laws. So there are challenges on the basic system now going along at the same time that you had the, the um, recently you had uh, an effort at Northwestern to unionize players, which is a truly bizarre concept <laughs> because if players had collective bargaining rights, the first thing they'd bump into is that under NCAA uh, rules, they don't have any, any individual bargaining rights. I mean, I, I talked to you about this. Mm -hmm. The minute a player asks for anything, seeks uh, b better working conditions, shorter practices, um, anything like that, uh, anything of tangible value, it's an ethical violation to the NCAA. So if they're collective bargaining rights are sustained, which will take years, and I don't know that it'll happen. I think other things will happen before that. They be the first labor pool in history to win collective bargaining rights when they don't have any individual bargaining rights. That's it's so kind strange. of an absurd system, yeah. but it just it's beginning to open people's eyes to the fact that all of these myths are, are harmful and that we need to reexamine. We don't even give students or athletes who are students, a good education to think critically about how college sports fits within the university. Mm -hmm. Because the amateur rules make that a taboo subject, you can't get a course at Ohio State. I, I, I guarantee you there won't be courses there where athletes study what is the economic value of, of their work playing on the Ohio State basketball team because it, it would bump into all of these taboos about how the system is, is working. So in, in that real sense, the, the schools are, are failing their basic educational purpose in the sense that um, this subject is dealt with entirely by mythology and fearful taboos that allow the universities to keep control of the money and keep the, keep the students um, from, from uh, exercising rights that the rest of us take for granted. Right. And that what you just kind of discussed, that potential class, it kind of reminds me of, well, a two-folded question, I guess, where there is there is a racial dimension to all of this as well. And I, I wonder if you can expand on that. And also what you just mentioned, it's you know also influencing higher education. Um, yeah. Well, innovative... the higher education part is hard because you have to be somewhat familiar with the antitrust implications and the myths of the athlete and the, and the mm -hmm. basic issues of rights. But the fact of the matter is that universities uh, exist to be places for critical, independent thinking uh, uh, about how the theoretical world impacts uh, the practical world. On the subject of college sports, they fail that miserably mm. um, because the, the universities are, are so nervous and, and tentative uh, and defensive uh, about their role that they don't allow uh, open thought. I mean, it, it, it's only a few months ago that that the Northwestern players were allowed by the NLRB to take a vote on whether they wanted to unionize. And as soon as this happened, the whole apparatus of Northwestern came down on them, saying that mm -hmm. this was scary and you don't know what you're doing. We have your best interests at heart, and this is going to ruin you, and you may lose your scholarships and so on. So they mounted a campaign against that, that's exactly the opposite of what you would hope a university would do, which is to say you have a very interesting choice to make, and we're going to bring in people who can open your minds and give you information on all sides of this question like a university should. 
instead of behaving like a university should, Northwestern behaved like a, a coal mine trying to break a miners' strike a hundred years ago, hmm. uh, and 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 that shows a, a huge gap. Um, between what a university is in relation to college, uh, big-time co- commercial sports, and what a university ought to be uh, in its fundamental charter to, to promote um, you know, quality, independent thought. By, by holding so dear this idea of the amateur, kind of, which mm-hmm. is the ideal college student in some ways, colleges are becoming more almost corporate, or I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's Yeah, seems they like- are. They are, and... And uh, it, it, it's why it is important to go back to to, to what is the the, the nature to the meaning of the word amateur because um, who decides who is an amateur? Those questions are, are most basic, and and uh, we want other people to be amateurs. We don't want ourselves to be amateurs, and in fact, we don't believe that it would corrupt us. Um, to to be paid for doing what we love, mm. um, and every professional athlete I know says you can't be a profession, good professional athlete unless you love your sport. So they love it, but that has nothing to do with the fe- with whether or not they get paid for it. Right. <laughs> uh, and somehow we convince ourselves that if athletes uh, got paid, they would not only not love their sport that they're doing the way we want them to love it, but it, that if they were getting paid, they wouldn't want to study. Because if somebody gets paid for doing one thing, they're not wa- going to want to study doing something else. So um, we have all kinds of, of strange thoughts that we're willing to impose on other people um, uh, to deprive them of making their own choice. Now, you mentioned race. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a racial element in this, but I think people have to be careful right. about it because these amateur rules were adopted by the NCAA. I mean, the formative... The NCAA, until 1950, had absolutely no power to do anything. Uh, They didn't even have full-time employees. They didn't get their first full-time employee until 1951. They didn't have an office. So it was only with the rise of television after World War II, uh, really after the Korean War, that the NCAA uh, got all this uh, money and, and began enforcing these amateur rules. In 1950, when that began, there were very few black college players in college sports. Uh, in fact, many schools, uh, you know, were still segregated. Uh, and, and so the rules were not applied with a racial uh, bias at all. Um, the University of Texas won the national football championship in 1969 with a team of 95 players who are all white. Nowadays, the, the sport is predominantly black. But um, uh, that's a recent phenomenon, and young people today need to be reminded that even college basketball was largely white through the 1960s. It was a big deal in 1966 when the traditional all-white powerhouse from Kentucky lost Mm -hmm. to a team from El Paso, Texas, that had five black players. It so enraged Adolph Rupp, the coach of uh, Kentucky, that he banned well, he was on the rules committee, and he was instrumental in banning the dunk shot. He, he, he was so mortified that he had lost to black players. He was a traditional segregationist that for eight years you couldn't dunk in college basketball because it was seen as something that black players were really good at and, it, and the white coaches didn't like it. So this shows that the, the racial element of amateur rules wasn't were. There wasn't a racial mode. The amateur rules predated the predominance of black athletes in college sports. H- having said that, though, the deprivation of rights now really falls heavily against particularly the skill positions in, in big-time college football and basketball are disproportionately uh, African-American. And so you do have an awful lot of African-American players from poor families uh, who have a hard time uh, eating or traveling home uh, under scholarship restrictions uh, by the NCAA at a time when they're generating millions of dollars for their school. And um, uh, it, race could be a factor in people's unwillingness or their resistance to deal with the underlying issues of equity and fairness. 
uh, which people are always bouncing off of. They always want to say, well, if, if players had rights, it would ruin college sports or it would do this, that, or the other. Um, and when they do that, they forget basic principles of almost constitutional uh, law. You, you begin with questions of rights and adjust everything else. If you want, if, to, to begin with what might be inconvenient or what you can't foresee or changes you don't foresee and uh, as a way of avoiding rights, is the path to corruption. I mean, you've got to start with the rights first and figure out what's fair and then and then make adjustments from there to, to, to accomplish your other goals. And so as, as a civil rights historian, what do you see as the greatest common factor between like the civil rights movement and the current motions against the NCAA and problem of college sport? Yeah. Well, I think there is a similarity in 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 uh, psychologically in people's attitudes. The the resistance to think clearly and face squarely the underlying issues of rights. In the civil rights era, very very few people, uh, even at a time when segregation was established, when it was in the constitutions of southern states, um, when there wasn't a single elected official in the 17 southern states as late as the early 1960s that advocated repealing the segregation laws. They were the established uh, thing. Um, people did not want to deal with the, those basic issues. They wanted to deal with what would happen uh, if you change segregation. They wanted to, to deal with um, the chaos that it might cause, the fear that it might cause, the troublemaking that it might cause. Very few people um, spoke directly to Martin Luther King and said, I disagree with you on principle for the following reason. Segregation is right, and your freedom movement is wrong on principle, and, and this is my argument. What they did instead was to say, well, you may be right, but you shouldn't be breaking the law, you shouldn't be having demonstrations, you shouldn't involve, uh, you're causing strife, you're causing harm. You're, in the civil rights era the, uh, around race, which is also true in the Civil War period of the abolitionists who wanted to deal with the underlying principles and, and, and rights of slavery, people hated abolitionists not because they thought they were wrong, but because they feared they were right, they didn't want to deal with it, so they dealt with the consequences, the side issues. You abolitionists are terrible because you're going to cause uh, friction with our southern states, you're going to you're going to drive up the price of cotton. You're going to make people angry, uh, so on and so forth. So, what civil slavery and the Civil War it, rights era in the '60s has in, have, both have in common with thinking about college sports today is that people tend to bounce off the underlying questions of rights mm -hmm. to deal with something else, and that's really a uh, something that that's more convenient or or, or something they, they recoil from it. And that is a telltale sign that something's wrong and that they don't want to deal with the questions of rights because eventually uh, that's what you're going to have to do if, if, if this is going to be fair. Uh, ironically, big-time college sports, in addition to all of these questions of rights that I've mentioned in the antitrust suits and the union movements and the protests mm -hmm. by the athletes themselves that are, that are just beginning, um, Big-time college sports is really coming apart more over uh, in quarrels over money between the schools that are making a lot of money, the ones that just changed the rules of the NCAA, and the ones that are getting some of that money but not earning it. So in a, in a sad way, um, the unity of college sports uh, is breaking apart in squabbles over money uh, from uh, between the, the – the ones who, who have a lot of it and the ones who don't have very much. <laughs> you can see that happening. You know, every member, all 1,100 members of the NCAA get a subsidy from the NCAA, which is reaped, you know, 95% of their budget is gen generated by the fact that they still control the TV rights for March Madness. <laughs> and um, they take uh, that money is generated by the big-time schools. Ohio State's one of them. They're, they tend to be in the NCAA tournament. Uh, along with Florida and co the, the big football schools and the big basketball schools have a heavy overlap. But that money is taken through the NCAA for basketball and distributed among a 1,000 schools that have a stake in it. And um, the big schools don't like it, and uh, 
they they want to keep all of their money. Why should we have to share it with Hofstra? Um, and so a, a lot of this is coming apart in a thieves' quarrel um, over how to divide the spoils that have been reaped uh, uh, from the, uh, the the rules that deprive college athletes of their fair share. Uh, to fix our universities, we have to think clearly about it in every respect from whether the education it's giving is pertinent and, and whether the tuition loads are too big to, you know, what is, it, what is the balance uh, with the world of sports um, as, as made clear by the, the sports right there on the campus that you can look at and study and learn from. Thank you so much for that tie-in to, to end things on, and we really appreciate you joining us today, Taylor. Thank you very much. This edition of the Origins Podcast History Talk was brought to you by the Public History Initiative and the Goldberg Center in the History Department at The Ohio State University. Our main editors are Stephen Kahn and Nicholas Breifogel. Our executive producer is David Staley. Our audio and technical advisor is Paul Koheimer. Our audio producers and hosts are Patrick Payandi and Leticia Wiggins. You can find our podcasts and more at our website, origins.osu.edu, on iTunes and on SoundCloud. And as always, you can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Tumblr. Thank you for listening.